Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pro Camera Reviews, the show where the review staff of the photographer talks about what we're working on and some of our favorite things when it comes to camera gear and all that kind of stuff. My name is Chris Gampett. I'm the editor-in-chief of the photographer. I am joined by Paul Ipp, our reviews editor. Hey, folks. How's it going? Thanks for joining us again. And Brett Day, our gear editor. Hey, everyone. We have a very fun show for you today, especially if you are a Sony fan, because we are talking about a bunch of stuff, Sony. But we're going to start the show off with some of our favorite cameras from yesteryear that we still love even today. And we're specifically focusing on digital cameras, let's say like the past 10 years, 12 years, something like that. Then we're going to talk about some of our favorite portrait lenses for the Sony FE camera system. And then after that, I'm going to do a little bit of a dive into the Sony RX100 Mark VII. I finally have it in for review. And uh, it's been interesting playing with it during the pandemic right now. So uh, you'll hear my thoughts. And I mean, uh, you guys probably read a little bit of it, Brett and Paul. Yep. Yeah. So... Uh, I've got some pretty interesting things to say about that camera. It's it's a camera that's very, very capable, but I feel like Sony can take it even more, uh, even further. So we'll be discussing that a bit. But let's get right into our first topic, our favorite cameras that we miss from yesteryear. So uh, I guess, Brett, I'll have you start this off, but tell us about like your first digital camera and then talk about some of your favorites from yesteryear. Oh man, well, my first digital camera, and I actually had to look this up because I couldn't remember the, the name of it. It was this Samsung point and shoot camera that had like a 2.1 megapixel sensor, point and shoot. Um, I remember picking it up, it was like 2003 maybe. Um, that was my very first dive into digital cameras and it was an absolute pain in the butt. <laughs> it was one of those cameras where you'd hit the shutter and it would take like four seconds to snap a picture, you know. Oh man. Uh, back in the good old days when digital cameras came out. But um, that was my first jump into digital cameras. But then after that, um, my first real DSLR digital camera would have been the Canon Rebel XT. Um, I don't know if you guys ever used one of those, but to me, that was just absolutely mind blowing. Um, it was a eight megapixel sensor, I think, and it was it felt like my old film cameras. You know, had that beautiful grip and all that kind of good stuff. And that was really my 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 first real, I'd say, my first real digital camera. And I learned a lot of things with that camera in terms of digital, and it really helped me get into learning how to process images. But um, from there, I, I was always Canon. I've always been a Canon guy, and I spent close to two decades. So all of my favorite digital cameras are all Canon gear. Um, I used that XT for probably four years and then I jumped right into the, the Canon 6D when it came out. I think it was like, what, 2012, 2013? Yeah, that sounds um, about right. And uh, man, that was my first full frame camera. Absolutely loved that thing. Um, used it a ton for astrophotography and portraits. And um, I loved it just because of the, uh, the, the high ISO performance on that camera is, is amazing. It still is one of the best high ISO cameras, I think, uh, but you can get, and you can pick them up for a song now, an absolute bargain. Um, and then from there, I jumped right into the, the 5D3, which um, that was my workhorse camera for many, many years. And, and um, I had that thing, it was up there in the hundreds of thousands of actuations and it was just keeping on going. <laughs> and I hated to get rid of it, you know, when, I, when it came time for me to, to buy a new camera it was kind of like a love-hate thing because i didn't want to put it down and stop using it but at the same time i knew i needed to move on but um i mean those three canon cameras for me are, are my my digital camera love story so what was it like for you to move from APS-C up to full frame because that's something that a lot of people are still experience even today yeah i mean i know a lot of people think the differences are going to be are going to be huge to me i didn't I didn't feel like it was such a huge departure jumping from APS-C to full frame. Um, I mean, obviously you get the greater depth of field, but um, I mean, for me, it, it wasn't as, as big of a, a jump as people had made it out to me to be. Uh, maybe that's just, you know, me personally, I don't know what you guys have experienced with that, but to me it was, it was, it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, especially when you're coming from the X, uh, the XT, because I remember that was around the time, not too far away when the XSI came out and the XSI was a fantastic camera. Yep. Yeah. What about, uh, what about you, Paul? 
Uh, I've got a couple. I'm, so I try to keep it relatively recent, like within the past decade, because uh, otherwise I could just go even further back. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> so on my list, uh, I have one, I have one quote unquote conventional camera and then the other two are kind of quirky. So I guess I'll start with the oldest one on the list, which is actually a Fujifilm camera. It was a point and shoot that I picked up, I think, back around college time. Uh, it's a Fujifilm FinePix F30. Uh, I, like, it was, uh, it was a pretty great camera for the time. Um, it had excellent high ISO performance. I think, if I remember correctly, it was one of the first cameras that could, uh, first point and shoots anyways, that could produce uh, good results. Uh, not world shattering results by today's standards, but you know, good results uh, up to ISO like 3200. Was it one of those super zoom cameras? Um, it's not a super zoom. I've heard, I think it was like an 8 to 24 millimeter, but I think it was like a one inch sensor. So it comes out to be maybe like a, like a 20 to 55 or something, some, some, something like that. I have, to, I have to look it up again. I don't remember the exact uh, conversion. Uh, it, it was, it was, you know, it was back in when I was still using CCD. So uh, I, I took this thing everywhere. I took it to concerts. It's, it survived quite a bit until it ultimately met its demise. Uh, I think during um, like a like at some party, uh, it got like passed around and then, you know, it just didn't turn on again. So I'm sure someone poured beer on it or something. Uh, so that thing was great. It was uh, by today's standards, it's kind of chunky, but um, if you guys remember the, uh, Fuji Natura that we were talking about a couple episodes back. It's about the same size, so you could pretty much pocket it. Uh, and then another quirky camera that I'm quite fond of, even though it wasn't, it, it was it was great on paper. The execution left quite a bit to be desired. It's the DXL One. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers this camera. It basically. The internals were, they, they use all Sony parts on the internals. I think it was uh, the same one inch sensor you found on some of their RX cameras. And it basically can attach to your iOS device, so your iPhone or iPad. And it gave you a mirrorless camera that you could basically use when attached to your phone. Uh, it was like, it was pretty small. Was, um, I wish I had. I couldn't. I don't know where I like stuffed it. It's in a closet somewhere. It's it's tiny. Didn't that thing have problems like actually staying in because it used the lightning port? Yeah, I think they had some issues and they revised it. Uh, the one that I had didn't have that issue. So uh, I think there was like a revision where it was the original, like the the version one, was kind of flimsy. But uh, the one that I got, I never ran into that issue. And it was actually pretty cool because, you know, I, I could walk around my phone and if I really wanted to get a better shot than what my phone was capable of, I just plugged the DXL one into my uh, iPhone and then it would fire up the app pretty much right away and I would have raw capabilities on my phone. Um, so, you know, just compare, just, just compare, like comparing like a one inch sensor to what was on the phone was night and day obviously you know nowadays i just have a camera with me anyways because you know that, that's what i do and and you know I, there's no need for me to carry that little dongle anymore. also by today's standards it's not as quick and also like dxl is not really around anymore as a camera manufacturer they're really just a software company and a uh and a, and a lens testing lab so or camera and lens testing lab so it, it, it kind of died unceremoniously. There were talks that they were developing it further um, two years ago, I think, right around, yeah, during, like, you know, I, I met with the guys over at uh, Photo Plus and, you know, like maybe two months after that, the f company basically folded and, and we got restructured, so... There, you know, there goes that camera. Um, you know, if I find it, I'll post a picture and uh, we can talk about it. Um, 
Yeah, so that was pretty quirky, and I had a lot of people to ask me what it was because it looked it looked like a uh, almost like an IR camera that you would attach to your phone. So it's pretty similar in the form factor if you've used those uh, the, like the IR cameras. And then, they're really really weird. It looks like a DSLR grip, basically. You just put on the end um, of the phone. Yeah, it kind of it, yeah. So it's so here's my here's my iPhone, right? So you would attach the little guy. It's it's basically this this big it just attaches and you could tilt it up and down so like you could get some creative angles if you like aim the camera up and such so i i got some interesting environmental shots using that just like walking around new york city and uh yeah the, you know for the time the the image quality was amazing because basically you had like an rx 100 two or three basically attached to your phone Except you know your phone, like your iPhone is doing all all of the heavy lifting, and the and you know you just have the camera module. So, like the execution is a little bit different, but it's not dissimilar to some of the camera add-ons we've seen uh, with like um, uh, like Motorola phones, where you know you basically attach a lens to the phone, or like even Sony's done it themselves. They've made. Uh, camera attachments for phones that you kind of just snap on and you get a actual proper camera sensor rather than the tiny one that you have in your phone. Yeah, yeah. but they don't make those anymore. No, yeah, I think it, that was just so niche. And then also uh, most of the phone manufacturers now have just completely stepped up their game in terms of computational photography to compensate for the physical restrictions you have on, you know, on the uh, phone sensors. So, you know, that's I think that market, we're not really going to see a resurgence with this type of camera at all. Uh, and then the third camera, uh, I was going to say the 5D Mark II, but you guys kind of covered that already. Uh, like everyone that's ever shot Canon pretty much, you know, swears by that camera. To this day. And, you know, for rightly so, because that camera was revolutionary at this time. And still to this day, it's a great camera. Uh, but for me, the third camera would be the Sony A6000, actually. Uh, the reason I I picked that uh, over you know the 5D Mark II was um, couple, like right around this this was five six years ago when mirrorless first became a thing and I was taking a trip to Ireland and uh, uh, and so what like you know I was traveling. It was me and a buddy was traveling. We're trying to keep you know, keep our gear light because we're we're going to be there for like a whole week. And also, like you know, like I didn't want my all my expensive gear to get stolen. You know, so I was like, hmm, what can I do? And then the A six thousand had just come out, so you know, I was toying with the idea where I'm like, oh, you know what, like mirrorless, like you know, there was kind of still very new at the time, and. I, I picked it up just to give it a shot and took it on a trip with me. I think I had, I had the two kit lenses, which they're decent. You know, I, I managed to shoot, shoot some uh, really great images with it, at least to me anyways. And I also had the uh, 18 to 105 and the 10 to 18, uh, both F4 zooms. So I had those with, uh, with me and I had some of my older Minolta glass as well that I adapted. Now I, I have, you know, I've been shooting Minolta uh, on analog for, for quite a, quite a while. So I had some of those lenses lying around too. And that camera was the one that just really opened my eyes to what mirrorless was capable. And that's kind of when I thought, thought about like after using it during the whole trip, it, completely changed my mind as to whether or not you know like mirrorless was just a fad versus you know like oh you know like dsl all the way in some ways it was kind of like the whole analog to digital revolution where people was oh no i'm going to be shooting film forever and then eventually people understood the capabilities of digital that's kind of what the a6000 opened my eyes to you know it really showed me some of the things that, were, that I was able to accomplish uh, on mirrorless, you know, granted, yes, it's a APS-C body, but it, you know, once, it, as long as you understand the physical limitations and the, like, and also just the di difference uh, in terms of physics between APS-C and full frame, 
uh, you know, it's, it's 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 just a camera. A camera is a camera is a camera, you know? Yeah, but it's also interesting that you're saying that, like, for you, it was a revolution. Because people think about that in terms of, like, this was film, and then it went to digital. And then yeah. this is a DSLR, and then it went to mirrorless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, because, you know, without having tried it, uh, you know, like doing what we do, we get press releases all day long and it's just superlatives, right? You know, it's, oh, this is the best, whatever, the fastest, the, you know, the bestest, you know, like the like the, the biggest, you know, uh, all, all those superlatives get thrown around. But once you actually use it and you, you test out the performance, you, you know, and using it in real life situations, that's how you get an actual handle on how these things play out. And having used a camera, like used a camera that whole trip, it showed me what it was capable of. You know, I'm getting it. I'm actually, sometimes I still miss having a camera that small just when I'm like, if I just want to go out uh, and not have to haul all my gear with me, you know, like maybe just bring the, the Billingham that I showed off last week. Right. If I, you know, I could pack a lot more with a APS-C body and lenses uh, compared to a full frame body and, you know, full frame lenses, you know? So that opened my eyes to what it was capable of. Like that form factor if you, I don't have the A6000 like right next to me at the moment, but it's ba- it's basically a rangefinder style uh, body, and it's absolutely tiny. So you know, it just if you really want to have a minimal kit, that form factor is great. And you know, now they've since introduced quite a few uh, new versions of like newer of versions of the camera. You know, we've we've seen the a61 basically now the a6000 has been they're no longer making it the a6100 is the new uh entry quote-unquote entry level 6000 series camera from sony and then you have the 6300 6400 6500 and the 6600 i think the 63 and 65 are being phased out in favor of the 61 and 66 but yeah that makes sense yeah so it, it basically you you know, you're able to um, achieve similar results, if not the same results on, you know, on a much smaller system. And that that's kind of why I kind of, you know, miss it a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the A6000 was a very revolutionary camera in many ways. And now, like, you could probably use the successor's as like a backup body to an A7 oh, or an A9. Absolutely. Body. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I know a lot of uh, professional shooters that shoot with Sony. They, they just keep an A6600 in their in their bag, uh, just as a B camera, or sometimes if they're all, if they're a hybrid shooter. Um, the 6000 series cameras are super popular for video as well. So uh, yeah, it's i recommend that series to a lot of people that are just starting out because it's relatively affordable it's small and you know it's cheaper than the full frame equivalent so if you're just getting like just dipping your toes in into getting more serious about your photography it's not a bad way to go yeah i agree and then you pair it with like a small sony prime or something like that. oh absolutely uh, yeah the for the longest time the the um, 50 millimeter 1.8 uh, APS-C lens never left that camera. It was just as a portrait shooter, that was one of the best native lenses you could get. And um, now you've got Sigma's got a 56 millimeter, which is excellent as well. And then you, uh, you've you got a lot of other third party lenses for APS-C, uh, for Sony E-mount APS-C. So there's, you're not, you basically won't have to worry about lenses if you're moving into that system yeah no totally i'm gonna get into uh what i like so first off the original a7 which i'm gonna show you next uh i still own that camera and i really like it but okay so this is the a7r3 now listen to the shutter on this thing oh wait it's in movie mode derf can you hear that Mm -hmm. okay so that's it. That's the original. That's the A7R3. And now the original A7 has this shutter that sounds like a real camera. So so much nicer. Can you hear that? 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the shutter sounds completely different. Oh yeah. And for some odd reason, like a lot of people, like they sometimes complain about the shutter on this thing, but I love it. Like, but I'm used to shooting with like big Mamiya medium format cameras. So I'm a little different that way. The A7 original is still one of my favorites. The reason why is because um, it was affordable. It was small. It felt good in the hand. Uh, but compared to today's technology, like Sony has come leaps and bounds over. But in terms of sensor performance, that thing is still very close to the current A7 III. So usually when I'll shoot with that camera, I will really just like saturate everything really heavily and I'll do like my painting uh, thing. So let me demonstrate that again for you guys. So basically what I would do, and I know I did this last week, uh, you would stop down to let's say like F2.8 and you would go to a very low ISO, like maybe 100 or something like that. And then you would slow, uh, stop down to like a slow shutter speed, like let's say 115. And then you focus on something and then you'd pull down and then you'd shoot and then you keep pulling through. And that what would happen is you would get that really nice streaky effect. So this camera, when I do it with that, like it's really even better. It's so vivid and it's gorgeous. And I think also like that's one of the early complaints I remember people having about Sony cameras was they were too vivid and they were too punchy versus like Canon stuff or Nikon stuff. And then they fixed that with the second series. More people started coming over and they also improved a lot of other things about it. But that to me is actually still one of my favorite cameras and I still use it every now and again. Um, I'll especially use it for like product images. Like people, I'll sneak it in and people won't realize that it's like, oh yeah, these are from an older camera. So yeah. Um, same thing with the X-Pro1. Uh, the X-Pro1 is actually in my bag. I should have taken it out. But the X-Pro1 has the first 16 megapixel x trend sensor and the images from that thing looked perfectly like film like you can look at the images from that thing you'll be like oh man they look really nice and then suddenly when fujifilm upgraded the sensor like the second version i think it was a 24 megapixel version it didn't really look as much like film and now with the current version it does look again a lot like film because a lot of their community was saying the same thing that i was saying so that was another one of my favorite cameras. The 5D Mark II, I'm right there with you guys. Um, my first digital camera was, oh man, an HP PhotoSmart. I oh, don't know how- Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you guys will Ooh, remember that, is that a camera. Rollback, damn. <laughs> yeah, um, that was when HP was still making cameras and they could integrate into their uh, printers. And so I remember, we didn't have a digital camera in our house growing up for a really long time until I got into photojournalism class in college. Mm -hmm. And back then my mom was like, Hey, well, why don't you use my Olympus film camera? And I'm like, cause I need digital. Like we won't have time. And she made this giant stink about it. And so we got like the cheapest point and shoot we could at like Staples and that was it. So we got that. And I remember like there were a lot of these weird quirks to it, but it still had this really beautiful image quality and it had like this brushed metal feeling. And again, when you needed to make prints, which we needed to do in photojournalism class, you could really just like uh, hook it up to your printer and it would immediately print and I wouldn't have any problems because I wouldn't have to like fight for students uh, for time in the lab. So it was easier for me. From that, I decided I would buy myself an Olympus uh, E510, that's what it was, the E510 DSLR. Um, that was a compact body similar to the Canon Rebels, came with a two lens kit. And the reason why I bought it was because it had image stabilization built in. And at the time I was working at PC Magazine. Um, I was an intern there. And we had reason for me to have that camera because I needed to shoot in low light a lot. So. I remember this one shot that I got of Aerosmith uh, for the Guitar Hero party by Nintendo, and it was very, very low light. And I remember getting this really great shot of Steve, uh, Steven Tyler, kissing like one of uh, the other board, the band members. And I got it at ISO 400, and it was crisp and it was tack sharp. And the reason why is because of the image stabilization. So that camera helped me a lot. 
And then I went up to the 5D Mark II, uh, like you guys, and fell completely in love with that camera. And then when the 5D Mark III came out, like, I know you liked it, Brett, but when I came out, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, what did they do? It feels like a 7D upgraded. And I owned the 7D originally. And that was an okay camera, but I didn't like the 5D Mark III. The 5D Mark IV was okay, but I've always been more of like a 6D guy because if the 6D bodies, I feel felt like that old 5D Mark II body type of style. A um, couple others that I really liked, the original Olympus EP-1, if you guys remember that. Uh, that was their first pen camera. It also had a beautiful Leica-like shutter, and it just looked gorgeous. Like, if you remember all of the mods that people were doing with adapting old vintage lenses onto that camera and putting them on Flickr, like, it started a whole revolution. People got really excited about it. They didn't really get as excited about, like, the previous camera before that, which was the Panasonic G1. But the Olympus got people really into it, uh, partially because of the stylishness. And then the Leica M9. Um, one of our friends actually owns one, and I'm very jealous of him for it. But that sensor had this really beautiful look that looked a lot like slide film. And there's nothing else on the market that really produces something like that today. Um, no one's even really making cameras with CCDs anymore. Uh, yeah. There are probably like some higher end like Phase and Hasselblad ones, but even those, I doubt it. Um, and I really wish that we went back to CCDs. There's a lot of advantages that they have over uh, CMOSs in many ways. So maybe it'll happen. Like if you get people clamoring enough, I think it'll happen. So yeah, those are some of my favorites. Um, it seems like go it ahead. reminded me of I, I just, I, I'm thinking about it now and I totally forgot about this one camera I had so when I said earlier that I switched to Sony I actually shot with Sony a long long time ago you guys remember the Mavica I was going to say the same thing my friend <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually own a couple of Mavicas and now I totally forgot I even own those yep yeah you're shooting digital images on floppy disks. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah, for the younger people that are maybe watching right now, floppy disks are what looks like the save icon. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, maybe in the next week or one of the later episodes, I'll dig that camera up with some floppy disks and just show you guys what, what I'm talking about. But weren't, yeah. they, weren't the files like 640 by 480 or something? <laughs> Something it's, crazy it's like that? atrocious by today's standards. But yeah. you know what? To be able to write images onto a floppy disk and then just, you know, plug it into my, my old PC back then, phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah phenomenal. And then, yeah, and then kind of like, so I kind of think I've always had a connection with Sony um, going way back uh, so Sony actually, Sony Digital Imaging was basically uh, Sony corporate. They purchased Konica Minolta for those that aren't aware. And way, 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 way back, I had a uh, Minolta Konica Minolta 7D. That's, oh man! That's a, yeah, that that's not the same 7D you would find from other manufacturers. This is way back. So yeah, it's that's one of, one of um, that's like one of my first digital cameras, like quote unquote real digital cameras. So yeah, just you, you sometimes you forget what you like you've owned because you just sh you've shot with so many different things. Yeah, that happens to us all the time. Like sometimes yeah. someone's just like, "Hey, what do you think of this camera?" I'm like, you know, I haven't shot with that in a while. Let me go back to my review and let me remember everything. It just happens with it's us. hard because like right now it's slowed down a little bit but like we're sometimes we're dealing with the, the same manufacturer releasing three pro like three product cycles within a year which is insanity but that's just how quickly things move in the di space so hasn't happened that way yet this year nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll we'll see what happens in uh, 2021 yep. yeah or holiday season so it's great that you brought us back to Sony because we're about to talk about our favorite portrait lenses for Sony, um, for the Sony FD system specifically, so the full frame ones. Uh, we've all tested Sony cameras and we've all tested Sony lenses. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're going to spend a little bit of time. Um, 
I guess I might as well go into it because I have some of them here first. So you guys remember the 5518 Sony Zeiss lens? This is one of the first lenses that they released for the system. It's still very small. It's still incredibly sharp. It's known to be one of their sharpest. And I mean, it's, let me show you how small it is. Like this is my fist. It's not even as big as my fist. So this was one of my favorites. The reason why is because I don't really like the 50 millimeter field of view, but 55 is a little bit better for me. And sometimes I feel 85 is not wide enough for me. I never really liked 60. I hate 75. Um, but 55 works for me. And usually I can use this for like documentary stuff or like uh, candid portraiture or something shooting from like the head all the way down to the knees. So I've always found this to be a very fun lens and always performs well, um, even from like the original A7 up to the A7R3. And then I also recently finished testing the Sigma 24 to 70 F28 Art, significantly larger than the 55. And when I was shooting this with uh, candid portraiture and for events and stuff like that, this really started to grow on me. And I'm not a guy that usually likes zoom lenses, but this one, I was like, hmm, you know, like it's actually very versatile. It's very, oh wait, you know, this is the 35 one too. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're about the same size. So. Yeah, they really are about the same size. I was about to say, this is the 24 to 70 and this is the 35 one too. Yeah, they, 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 they're both pretty chunky. Yeah. Um, but when I was using this lens, I was like, wow, you know, like if when I'm beyond the 24 millimeter point, it's actually very solid as a portrait lens. Like a 50 millimeter is not bad. 70 millimeters, it's not bad. Um, 35 millimeters, it's pretty great. 40 millimeters, it's pretty great. So I've really liked this lens as well too. Mm, you know, I didn't really have any major problems with it. I know that a lot of people wanted image stabilization with it, but I was okay with it because I'm trained like to be able to hold my breath down to like 1 15th of a second and not really have any major problems. And then otherwise, like, I know a lot of people would say, oh, but 85 is so great. And, you know, a lot of people love the 85 uh G Master lens, but I've always had a soft spot for the 85 1.8 instead because it's so much lighter. You get most of the performance from the G Master in that lens. It's still weather sealed. It's fast to focus and it carries around really well. So I can attach it to a camera, put it in my camera bag, and it's not taking up a giant amount of space versus like the Sigma 35, which takes up a massive amount of space in my camera bag. So those are my three favorite portrait lenses. Um, Paul or Brett, which one of you guys wants to go next? Yeah, I, I can go next if you want. Um, I'm an 85 millimeter guy. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's just one of those focal lengths I absolutely jump to when I think of portraits. And just like you, the 85 uh, 1.8 on the Sony is phenomenal and it's, it's always the lens I always gravitate to when I pick up a Sony camera to take portraits. Um, like I say, the performance is phenomenal, but the uh, images are fantastic and the price point to get that much performance out of a lens that's sub 600 bucks um, is fantastic. Um, and then going back to something Paul said earlier on, I know I didn't bring this up earlier on in my list, but um, my first mirrorless camera was an A6500. And um, I actually used the 50 mil f 1.8 on that as well, just like pulled it on his A6000. And, um, that lens punches above his weight, man. Oh, man, it's fantastic. And like I say, I, I used that for so many of my portrait shoots when I had the A6500. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it. And it wasn't the fastest to focus, but I mean, it still produced incredible results. And again, back then, I was really always about affordability and 250 bucks for a 50 mil f 1.8 that lens was stupid cheap yeah. are you are you guys talking about the fe version or the no, original no, the 50, version 50 APS-C 1.8 oh that lens was great yeah. yeah for the longest time like so before like before i announced to the world that i made the switch people had no idea i switched because i'm still shooting same style portraits using a relatively similar focal length you know, it's a 75 millimeter version at true 85, but it's, it, you know, it, people had no idea. And I was, oh, you shot the with a, like, you shot the with a mirrorless crop sensor body. It, it like, that was so sensational when people, like, found out that I had made the switch. It was kind of crazy. 
Yeah, and I, I had the same reactions as well when it, people couldn't believe it, it's, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a fantastic lens to use, to grab mm -hmm. if you use an APS-C. And, um, and then going on from there, I'm also a traditionalist when it comes to like portraits for a 70 to 200. I love 70 200s for portraits. That one right there, the Paul's got that, that bad boy right there. I absolutely love that guy. Um, I'll show it to us. Uh, just talk a little bit while you have you it. Go. Yeah, the 70 to 200, the 2.8, uh, fantastic lens, excellent performer on Sony cameras, um, beautiful image quality, focus and speed is fantastic. Um, and just the versatility, I love the versatility in that lens when it comes to portraiture. You can shoot three quarters, you can go to full, you know, head and shoulder shot in a split second, fantastic lens to have if you're a portrait photographer. And then um, my other favorite lens would be the 35 f1.8 just because I love environmental portraits. And for me, 35 millimeter is, is a fantastic focal length for environmental portraits. So I absolutely love that lens as well. Yeah. Just to uh, add to the, just to add a little bit about this guy, the 70 to 200, um, you can also adapt it using the 1.4 or the 2X teleconverters. So if you're a casual bird shooter or wildlife shooter, that gives you about uh, 100 to 130 to like 400 depending on which adapter you use so it adds it, you, you're losing about a stop and a half of light but uh you know you you're getting significantly more reach with that same lens and you're only adding about maybe this this much length to the barrel so uh for people that prefer zooms not a bad way to go um personally though i'm a prime guy uh, I prefer shooting with primes, and uh, I will agree with both of you that the 8518 uh, for full frame is an excellent lens. However, I already owned this lens before that the 1A came out. This is the 85 millimeter f1.8 G Master, and this is probably my most used lens whenever I'm photographing humans. Um, I absolutely adore this lens. Um, it yes, it's heavier than the 1.8. Uh, it's obviously larger than the 1.8, but you know it's you you know there's no escaping the laws of physics. In order to have that wider aperture, uh, you know, you you need that extra glass. You know, is it heavy enough where like you can use it for a quarantine workout right now? Because I'm sure a lot of photographers need that. Um, honestly, I don't find it. So this is my current, this is my workhorse combo right here, A7R4, 85 1.4 uh, G Master, and I have the vertical grip here for the R4. I, I single hand hold this all day long. You, you guys have seen me do this in person. I mean, I'll have a wrist strap on it, you know, but other than that, it's not like heavy, heavy, but, you know, it's, that's kind of relative, depends on what's heavy to you. Some people have trouble lifting a soup can. And then some people lift jugs of like gallons of waters like, all day long. So I, I don't know. I, I guess you could lift it if you, if you need to do curls. But, you know, just grab a cinder block or something. Um, and then uh, here's, another, here's another lens I quite like. Um, this is the 90 f2.8 macro. Uh, I use this more, some t depending on the kind of portrait it work. Um, I may grab this over the 85. If I'm shooting super close-ups for like makeup or beauty work, I'll grab this lens because it got a much shorter minimum focusing distance. Uh, the maximum aperture is obviously only an f2.8, but if I'm shooting beauty or um, close-up portraitures, I'm usually shooting at f5.6, f8, or f11 anyway. So the wider aperture is not really an issue for me. And also it's a macro, so I could use it for, I actually use this for pretty much all of my product work. So it's a very versatile, uh, versatile lens for anyone that shoots high end beauty or uh, makeup portraits that you can't go wrong with the lens. It's only, it's less than a thousand dollars too. And it's stabilized, uh, weather sealed. Um, the other two lenses that I really like uh, for, for portraits, uh, I don't have them with me at the moment. It's the 135-18 G Master. That lens, I, if I recall correctly, I gave it Editor's Choice. Uh, I reviewed that lens, and it's a great focal length. The only challenge is 135. It's sometimes a little restrictive. You need, it's really an outdoor lens. 
if you're shooting indoors, the chances are it's hard. If it's not one that I would immediately reach for, like I would draft the 85 all day long, but there are only certain circumstances where I would opt for the 135, 18. You totally need a lot of studio space for it. Yeah, uh, I mean, in New York, you just, you know, most of the time you you have a challenging time shooting with the 135 unless you're only doing like three quarters or you know tight head shots. Uh, that lens out sings, absolutely sings if you're shooting outdoors with it. It's it just gorgeous. Uh, do I wish I was at 1.4? Sure. You know, I would also have preferred that it was stabilized, but, you know, then that's probably like the version two, and it'll probably be closer to like $3,000 if that was the case. Uh, and then um, the other, going to complete opposite spectrums, um, when I'm shooting more environmental portraiture work, one of the lenses I love absolutely love it's a 24 millimeter uh, f1.4 g master 24 millimeter is not a quote-unquote conventional focal length that a lot of people think of in relation to portraits but uh you know i'm just like patting myself on the show there a little bit one of the most used images on the site is uh, or portraits that i took using the 24 millimeter g master if you know how to properly utilize a focal length there's no like correct or incorrect focal length to use in relation to portraiture. Uh, the 35, I, I, I like 35, but sometimes like whenever I'm in a situation where I need to go wide, I almost like the 35 is almost never like enough. Maybe that's just because I live in New York and you know, space is cramped, but if I'm going to go for a 35, I might as well go for a 24 because then it really allows me to just like tell the story and set the scene and show more of the environment. Because if I'm already going for environmental portraiture, I want to get everything into the frame, right? Do you see in uh, 35, or do you see more in like 28 or 24, like personally? Uh, that is a good question. I've never really actually thought about that. I, I, I think it's maybe a 28. Yeah, I'm somewhere in between. Yeah, I okay. think, yeah, maybe a 28. So I'm going I'm to throw this in there. Um, when I was using Pentax, one of their limited lenses is the 31 millimeter. And to me, that was the, the sweet spot. I absolutely loved that lens. Yeah. yeah. 31 was perfect. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it, it's all situational, right? It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. You know, if I'm shooting street, like wide, you know, like go wide. But uh, if I'm shooting more environmental portraits or, you know, actual portraiture, then I would kind of like just uh, go, go in a little tighter. So between 24 and 135, it's like my, my sweet spot. You know, I'll go, I'll, like usually the increments I'll go is 24 and then I'll usually just jump to a 50 or the 55. Uh, the, like the 55 that Chris uh, mentioned earlier, one, to this day, still one of the best lenses, Sony FE. And also significantly quieter than the 518. Oh, geez. That <laughs> yeah, thing. the 518 sounds like someone's like just like uh, like scraping metal. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like a garbage uh, truck is coming by early on a Sunday morning it, at like it, 6 a.m. Yeah, it, it sounds like what, like 80s, like television show, like the sound effects they use for like robot noises. <laughs> That's what that is. Like, <laughs> you know. Uh, that thing hunts till kingdom come to, and uh, you know, just 85. Uh, I, you know, I'm hoping at some point we'll see a 105 f1.4 from Sony. Uh, because right now, the the only way you're gonna get that lens is from Sigma, uh, by using their Bokeh Master, which it's a bulky lens, it's, yeah. also, it's also adapted so it's dog. So, I, I love the folks over at Sigma, but. Just being completely objective, that lens is painfully slow by modern standards. Oh, yeah. It really is. Yeah, uh, it's massive, too. <laughs> it, that lens is ridiculous. Um, I th I think it's actually larger than the not. The the uh, the 58 millimeter 0.95 uh, not. From the Nikon. Nikon one? Yeah. Uh, but... Don't quote me on that. I haven't actually seen the two side by side. I've held, bo I've shot both of them and held both of them, you know, but they, they were n like not even remotely like close to each other. 
uh, when I shot th- those two lenses. So I, I kind of want to do that comparison. It's just in terms of like, here's the most ridiculous lens for you to walk around and go shoot street with. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, I guess those, uh, those four lenses will be my pick. All right. Uh, thanks for your contributions on that. Um, wow. I'm just thinking about all that because like we think totally different. Like I'm a guy that's like, 35, 55, 85, and then you and Brett sometimes go for, like, longer stuff and wider stuff. Like, meanwhile, I'm just centered in, like, that area. Well, I, so I think that also has to do with your background, right? Because you, you come from more of a photojournalist uh, background. So, yeah. naturally, 35 is your sweet spot, you know, like, 35 all day. Yeah. Like, I mean, 35, I'd grab a 35 if, I, if I'm purposely going out to shoot street. I throw a 35 on as, as a lens to start out. And then, you know, I may change it up as the day goes on, but you know, like it really depends on what you're used to shooting, I guess. Is that kind of, um, that, that kind of dictates what you gravitate towards naturally. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, now we are going on to uh, my current review that's being done of the Sony RX100 Mark VII. Um, Paul, I know you and I use the predecessor to this camera. Um, Brett, have you ever used one of these? It's been a very long time. What version was it? I can't even remember. It's one of the early ones. Okay. I can't remember, I can't remember what one it was. I think, I think I reviewed the six, if I'm remembering correctly. That does sound right. I also remember when we were trying it out during the press day and all the problems we had with the six. Yeah. You it, know, like autofocus and like the screen colorations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. 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 That was a while ago. Yeah. So the seven is better. Um, the seven is all intents and purposes. Like I've had this for a couple of days. It's a good camera but I do have a couple of problems with it. So I'm going to read through some of my Trello notes and what I'll be talking about later on. So the pros of this camera. So first off, it is very small as I drop my notes. (laughs) It is a very small camera. Um, Let me hold it up and let me get it off my watch first off. So this is my iPhone that I have the S uh, the eight plus. And then this is the RX 100 uh, Mark seven. I want to put them side to side. That's a case, and then that's the camera. Of course, the camera's larger. Now, this is still a small camera. Like, I can put it in my pocket, and I have no problems. It's fine. Um, I could probably put it in my pocket right now. So, pants, and I am wearing pants, and it's right there. Cool. So, it's really small. It's really pocketable. I actually did that yesterday. My buddy and I, we went out for a little bit. Um socially distancing and wearing masks and decided to shoot a little bit. So it's very small. It's very portable. That's a very big uh, plus about it. There is a lot of versatility. Uh, there's quite a zoom lens, uh, zoom range on this. That's very useful for a lot of photographers. It starts at F2.8. It goes down to F4.5. Yes, it does. Um, so that is another plus. You have a lot of zoom range in this small camera when people usually will probably just want to take their phone with them. So, you know, if you want optical zoom, this, here it is, you got it. Uh, the other thing is it's got very nice looking bokeh. Um, when you're shooting macro, it's beautiful. There are some things that are just a little weird to me about it, but I'm going to have to take more images with it to really understand like what I think is wrong with it. It just looks, some of it, you know, dare I say, it looks a little bit like, the bokeh you would get from a phone with uh, like portrait mode or something like that. So mm. yeah, I'm trying to figure that out and I'm, I have to do a lot more tests. I've only had this for maybe 48 hours, not even so far. So we're going to be getting into that. But that said, I have a lot of problems with this series that I don't feel have been fully addressed yet. So I'm going to get into those. So first off, this is a very slippery camera. Um, It's, there isn't really a lot of texture on it. It's very smooth, very classic. And I think that they need like a leatherette grip here. One of the best hacks that I've seen is you take a little piece of gaffer's tape and you put it on there and it's got some nice grip. This camera desperately needs that. 
or else it's going to fall, it's going to slip, and uh, people are going to have to buy another camera. I'm sure Sony doesn't necessarily want that or they want people complaining about it. So it's something to really consider for the next version of this camera. Um, a problem that I have with Sony cameras overall, a lack of interface with the touchscreen menu. This is the camera that I think, take a look at the back here. So there's a lot of space with this LCD and there's very little space over there for your thumb. And I think that a touchscreen menu would have helped me to navigate so much easier versus having to use the scroll wheel or something else like that. Like I, it really just makes no sense to me. Like Sony has this mentality that if it's touchscreen, it's not professional. And I think that for this camera, and I've heard that from the engineers myself, with this camera, a touch screen and the full implementation of it would have really, really made a lot of sense because I can navigate their giant menu system and I can say, okay, toolbox, page five, format immediately. And I'd have no problems. Um, and they have that quick menu setting, but it's not the same. Like you still have to go through it and it's still annoying. There's also no USB-C charging. And I think that like, we've talked about this many times amongst ourselves, like that's a standard for every camera these days. Uh, with our Fujifilm cameras, with our Sony cameras that we have higher end, Canon, my EOS R for some odd reason, like it won't charge via USB-C and I don't know why. Um, and with this, like there's a micro USB, they should have just found a way to put USB-C into it. And I think that that would have, that's a standard thing these days, like charging via USB-C, especially if you're traveling when this camera is really developed for traveling. Mm -hmm. It's not there and I don't know why. Um, there is a microphone jack as well too. So the microphone jack is great for video recording. And actually I tried to do that a little bit with this, but there's no hot shoe of any sort to really put the microphone on like a shotgun mic. So you have to get an arm to put the shotgun mic on. And I don't know why, like, let's say you're a, a vlogger for some odd reason or something like that. Um, well, not some odd reason, like let's say it's your job. You would probably use the microphone here built into the camera and then you would have like uh, a lavalier mic on you on the side. But let's say you're shooting something photojournalistically, which is something that I have to do. And I know a lot of tech journalists that actually use point and shoots like this. Mm -hmm. a, lav um, a shotgun mic makes a lot more sense. And having a hot shoe on there to shoot with that mic makes a lot more sense, but it's not there. Like you have a pop-up flash area and you have the EVF area and that's really about it. So that's something that I think really should be there. The, uh, I also think that it's about time that this camera gets a third exposure dial. Like there are two right now, there's the one around the lens and then there's the one here. And I think that if you want to shoot in manual mode, it'd be a lot more sense to put one right here underneath the zoom rocker. Um, but at the same time, uh, I do have a couple of problems with this aperture ring or the lens ring rather. I feel like it's a little too sensitive. Yeah, that, that's, that was one of the biggest challenges when I did the first impressions on that guy. That that ring really needs to be dialed in. It's it's too loose. Yeah, and I mean, like, there, I've seen options from other manufacturers where you have to press a button in and then you can change. I think that makes a lot more sense and it's a lot safer because otherwise, like, you're just walking around, you have it in your hand, and somehow or another you're like, okay, I'm going to be shooting at f2.8, but then suddenly your camera's at f8, and it's like, wait, what mm -hmm. the hell? What's going on? Yeah. Um, and I mean, maybe if you're shooting in program mode, like, actually, no, even then, like, it's not the same. So yeah, that's another big problem that I have with this. Um, I'm listing a lot of problems and I'm gonna get into better stuff. Just hold on a sec. The uh, in-camera retouching options are a little weird. Like I took a photo of myself and I was playing around and like I could change my skin tone to be either more blue, like a video game character that's like a zombie, like imagine like Sylvanas Windrunner from WoW. Or I could be browner or I could be whiter or I could have more green in my skin and that was I just felt a little weird and odd and I don't really know what they were going for with that and then I could do stuff like uh, widening my eyes uh, but the way that it would do it it would widen my eyes but my eyelids would look very very puffy um, 
And then it would do stuff like smiles and it would do uh, teeth whitening. And the teeth whitening, I think, was okay. Um, I've been to the dentist this year, so I don't necessarily need it that much. Uh, but I can see where someone who chugs coffee all the time might need it. So those are a little weird. I just have to play with them a little bit more. As I said, I've been playing with this for like 48 hours so far. Now here's a big one, the flash. There is a flash here, but I don't understand why for the vlogging crowd, it couldn't double as an LED light. Um, I think that's also very important for like macro shooting or just for like recording video. Like, I mean, this little thing right here, let me, let me bring it up. So it's got like this right there. And I feel like there could be like a little bit of an LED light right below, or they could put the diode right next to the flash. And it would be so useful for so many different photographers or for, you know, uh, videographers. Um, also, this series of camera desperately needs weather sealing. Um, it's been something we've been saying for a while. Their higher end cameras have some sort of weather resistance. This camera, like, Paul, you were talking earlier on about, like, the ca uh, one of the cameras you had getting beer spilled on it. This I feel as a camera that would be a lot more popular with college students if it could survive that kind of abuse. Um, yeah. yeah, and I've been saying that for a while, but they haven't really implemented it into this camera yet. I'm not sure why. Ergonomically, otherwise, I mean, it's a mixed bag. I do like the fact that it's so small. Um, the back, though, I either would have made the screen smaller and given myself more real estate over here because this is a little weird, or I would have made it just full touch screen. And I actually would have liked it if it were just touchscreen. Like, I feel like that is something that would appeal to all the people that just came from shooting with their phones over because now they have these buttons and like they can accidentally press them or something like that, or it's very small. So that's something else that I think is a little odd. Otherwise, I feel like, I mean, I don't have the biggest hands, but I feel like this camera could be even a little bigger. Uh, maybe coming out a little bit more that way or coming up a little bit more. And I mean, the viewfinder, like, I don't know about you guys, but I'd be okay if, like, this viewfinder wasn't something that popped out. I'd be okay if, it, like, it came up all the way here, and all I had to do was just put the camera up to my eye, and it was fine, and I could shoot. Um, I don't know how everyone else feels about that, but that's how I'm feeling about this. Um, partially because, you know, I'm used to the X100 series, and those are great for what they are. Um, also because, you know, I'm used to more rangefinder bodies. But even if, like, they added some leather out there and they made it taller and they made it wider, I'd be okay with it. The autofocus on this thing, uh, it's a big improvement, I feel, over the 6. The 6, we were having a lot of problems with street photography, but they put, was it the A9-1 or the A9-2's autofocus? Um, it, it basically uses the A9-1's AF algorithms. It's it's not the same engine, but it's basically using the same algorithm that the A1 uh, A9 uh, one had. They actually stressed that during the press briefing we're in. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so thank you for that. Um, with that autofocus upgrade, it's a lot more responsive. It's a lot faster. I have yet to test it for like actual street photography, and you know it's pretty difficult to do that right now. But I'm gonna try. Well, uh, yeah, so just, just chiming in on the AF part, uh, when I did the first impressions, we're at Condo. Uh, so um, if you guys went on the site and just looked for the RX 107's uh, first impression, you could see some of the AF performance. And so uh, we were at dinner, and they had basically an aerial artist on on a, uh, I think, they, what are they calling them? The hoops or the loops that the, the aerial performer was on? And she was basically spinning around and doing all sorts of acrobatics on it. It, it tracked her face the whole time. There was water droplets being, you know, poured in the background. And she was, she was continuously spinning and doing all sorts of crazy acrobatics. And the RX-107 kept, kept her, track of her face the entire time. So in that respect, it's super impressive. Well, we're going to see how that performs then in the streets, but then also in low light, because I do feel like people are going to use this around dinner time or something like that mm -hmm. when they're out. And I feel like that's going to be another test, especially when you're in like a place that's not as well manicured for lighting as like something that Sony would put on for us. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they had, they were blasting the performer with light. So 
you know, it's not like we, we really have to kind of throw the worst possible situation at, at the camera. Yeah, I mean, like, usually, like, when I used to go to burlesque performances, for example, it's not very well lit at all. You're not being blasted with lights. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to have to test it in more yeah. of like a real-life shooting situation. Yeah, unfortunately, we won't be able to do it now, but that that camera, I think, would do very well uh, to be tested at, like, a concert or something. Hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering if who, maybe... who knows when we're going to be able to go to those. Yeah, no, totally. Um, otherwise, you know... I, I feel like this is really a JPEG camera. I was trying to edit the RAWs and there isn't really a whole lot of versatility. So sometimes what I'm doing is I'm adding a preset from R and I or something like that, or I'm using one to capture one's presets. But otherwise the JPEGs from this thing are really, really great. Like they're vibrant, they pop. There seems to be a little bit of micro contrast. And I guess part of that is because of the Zeiss lens that's on here. But other than that, I mean, I, I have very mixed feelings on this camera. Um, I obviously do have to put it more through its paces, but <sighs> I don't know, man. Like, what do you guys think? I mean, what do you guys think of a lot of compact point and shoots these days? Uh, well, specifically with the RX-107, I almost wish that Sony made two versions of it. Uh, I've always said, like, ever since the 6, when they went from 24 to 70 to this huge focal range that they have now, one of the trade-offs was we now lost the ND filter that was built in on the RX100, like, version 5 and before that. Uh, it, it's like, to me, it's less important to get that crazy zoom range in the compact body, but just having a built-in ND is so much more helpful, especially for a camera of this size, because there's no front threat. So it's a challenge for you to put an ND photo on something like that. So if you're out and about just shooting, you're going to run into some challenging situations. Like if you want to do anything remotely long exposure during the daytime, you're going to run into issues, right? Uh, and, you know, it was good to see them improve the AF because that was a huge issue that we experienced from the six. Just yeah. You have such a long focal range. Like if you're on the long end at the 200 end, you really notice – the any like little shake and movement when you're holding the camera because uh, it's it's such a small body here's the one of the things right you always want things to be like light and small and compact but it's almost it's almost kind of uh you know you almost kind of want the opposite of that with cameras to some respect because you want a little bit of weight to your camera that helps actually helps you stabilize the camera so it does every little shake doesn't you know catastrophically affect the image which yeah. is why which is why like this to me is perfect some might oh it's so bulky and heavy i'm like well no because i can run and gun all day with this and not have to worry because it's not gonna like shake you know like unless you have like michael j fox level issues you're, you're gonna be okay <laughs> So, wow. <laughs> he went there. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's but, somewhere but, I would say, man. <laughs> but like, in all seriousness, like it's good that they kind of like addressed that with the seven. But I really wish that we would kind of see the two versions, where like you have the twenty-four to seventy version, and then you have the seventy to two hundred version, or you know, just for the people that want the ND, give me the twenty-four to seventy version. For the people that want the range, you could get the twenty-four to two hundred. You know. Mm -hmm. I think like that's one of those trade-offs that's like it, it's kind of rough and then you know give me like give me a better grip because I'll every like that was one of the few cameras where I always actually have to use a strap with because like it's just so easy to drop yeah that makes sense um another problem that I actually was having with it when you were just talking about that it made me think about it right now um I'm ha So far, for the past two days, I've been trying to pair this via Bluetooth with my phone, and it hasn't been working. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because that's how you apparently have remote control over the camera. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, with Imaging Edge. Yeah, but with the A7R3, I think you can do it via Wi-Fi, can't you? I know you could do it with the R4. Uh, actually, I have the R3. Because I can do it, but I don't think I'm doing it via Bluetooth. Uh, I would have to no. I think it's a it. I think they use uh, it uses the ad hoc Wi-Fi. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so that's what I thought. So with this, you have to do it via Bluetooth. And I've been having problems connecting to my phone via Bluetooth. And that to me is a little bit of a problem. But I guess like, you know, because I was shooting product images today um, with the uh, hold fast money maker, the vegan leather one. So I was like, okay, fine. I might as well put it on myself and shoot. So instead what I had to do was I had to do a whole bunch of this, but this presents its own line of problems with autofocus, continuous autofocus uh, won't always track me, for example. Um, when like I set it and I move back and I say, okay, fine. Um, set it to like three seconds and then track me. It will focus and then it will shoot and then it won't try to refocus on you and track you. So that's a little bit tough. And then you think, okay, fine. So what's the workaround? It's using Bluetooth on Imaging Edge, but I can't get it to work yet. So Yeah, Bluetooth is not really designed for large file transfers. So I just checked on my R3. The, it uses Wi-Fi for control and Bluetooth is mainly used for geotagging. Okay, so I don't know what's going on then. I'm going to have to do some investigation, so yeah. But I mean, you know, it's not a bad camera at all. It's very good. I'd oh, recommend it, it, it to a lot of people. Yeah, it's it's great for that form factor and price point. It's a phenomenal camera, uh, especially it's super popular with vloggers. Yeah, but I feel like at this point, like I feel like Sony's just not even really trying to do very much. They're just putting like very minor additions on or they're trying to change things internally when I feel like they're a company that really, really needs to learn things externally with ergonomics. Like when I sit there and I hold a Sony camera, like I don't really feel like they necessarily feel like cameras to me, like versus a Nikon or a Canon or a Fujifilm or a Leica. Um, I know a lot of people have expressed this. So yeah, that's just how I feel. Even I know I understand that it's a point and shoot, but they could do some things to make it feel less like it's just like this weird sort of smooth brick. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, it, it's challenging, right? Because it it's part of it. You also have to look at it from like a product segmentation point of view, because I think, and this is just me looking at their entire product stack, right? For so, like for example, the lack of a hot shoe. Uh, maybe the rationale there is for the people that want higher end audio. They those are probably more uh well, those are probably shooters that are already familiar with more professional equipment so you would probably be using a 6000 or a 7 or not like 7 series camera which has the multi interface shoe but then why have the mic input to begin with like why not just get well, rid of it and just go that's USB-C? interesting right like no i totally agree so maybe that's just so you could do like a lavalier mic or something i don't know but the the problem is if you put a hot show in that camera, then it kind of negates the point of that flip up screen that they made such a hoopla about. Because now it's like, oh well, okay, I can't even I can't even see the thing because you're blocking the screen. Yeah, but then I guess what they could do is they could actually have the screen that comes out like that, the way that right. But then you would have to orient all the input to the opposite side because your audio jack is right there. If you flipped out to the left. Uh, no, it is not. On the left, there's only the finder. And on the right, there's all the ports. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I need you to, yeah, it's been, a, it's, I, the last time I used this was back in August. Yeah, that's uh, what I figured. Yeah, I mean, listen, if we want to talk about, like, flippy screens on Sony's, we could do a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that in vintage cameras, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, but we're out of time. We've been doing this for like an hour and 11 minutes now. So thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will catch you next week. So take care. Um, if you are in the audience, stick around. We will have a more open conversation right after. Thanks a lot, folks. Thank, thank you, guys. Everyone. Okay, I am.